Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste. So far we have looked at why we need conservation, what are the threats to wildlife. Now the question is, how can we use the knowledge of economics for the aid of conservation? So now in this module, we'll look at how can economics help in achieving our objectives of conservation. And this module will have three lectures. The first one is the need to understand controls. Second is thinking as an economist. And the third is interdependence and gains from trade. So let us begin with the need to understand the controls. And we begin with a thought experiment. Let us consider that there is a 747 aircraft. And in this aircraft, there are two pilots. And these two pilots are in disagreement. The question is, is this plane facing an imminent danger? Can this plane go and crash? Is there something that is going wrong? Now, both of these pilots are extremely experienced pilots, but they are looking at different controls. And they are looking at these controls correctly. They are reading these controls very correctly. So both pilots are correctly reading the instrument dials. The pilot one is only looking at the altimeter, the onboard radar, and the position of the wing flaps. And the pilot two only looks at the fuel gauge, the air speed indicator, and the cabin pressure dial. Now the question is, is it okay to see only certain readings and ignore the rest? Because if both these pilots do not come to an agreement, and they cannot come to an agreement till they talk, or they look at each other's readings, now, if they do not come to an agreement, it is possible that both of them will spend their time in, it, in disagreement and the plane might go and crash. So, for instance, the pilot 2 is looking at the fuel gauge, but the pilot 1 is not looking at the fuel gauge. Pilot 2 looks at the fuel gauge, but the pilot 1 does not look at the fuel gauge. Now, suppose the fuel gauge shows that the amount of fuel in the aircraft is extremely low because of which the plane might not work. So it is possible that this plane that is flying, the engines will stop and it will crash. Now pilot two is seeing this uh, gauge and he is current. Uh, he is correctly reading that this plane is in imminent danger of crashing. But pilot one has turned his eyes off from this gauge. He is. He says that I'm not going to look at this gauge, whatever happens. Now what will happen? So this is this thought experiment tells us that whenever we are working for a common good, we need to be on the same page and we need to look at things in a more coherent manner. Now similarly, when we talk about economics or when we talk about conservation, why do we do economics? The aim of, of economics is to maximize the availability of resources to maximize the benefits of resources to mankind. And why do we do conservation? We do conservation for precisely the, the same purpose. Why do we need plants and animals? We need plants and animals for ourselves. Because if we do not have these ecosystems that are working properly, then that will lead to a harm to us as a species of Homo sapiens as well. So when both of us, the economists and the conservationists, are working towards the same goal, it is extremely crucial that both of them read all the dials together. Now, currently the situation is that the conservationist concentrates upon the loss of habitats, loss of biodiversity, coral bleaching, soil erosion, pollution, global warming, and all these things. And the conservationist says that the world is going towards the doom, similar to the second pilot. The second pilot says that, oh, uh, the fuel has gone, uh, the, uh, this fuel tank has gone empty. We are out of fuel. And so this plane is going to crash. 
Similarly, the conservationist is looking at all these different aspects. He is looking at the biodiversity and he sees that biodiversity is declining at a very fast pace. And so he says, oh, the earth is going towards the doom. But then we have the economist who concentrates upon increasing GDP, increasing per capita wealth and the resource efficiency. And the economist says, oh, all over the world, the GDP is rising. The per capita GDP is rising. We are using resources with exceedingly greater efficiency. So there is no cause for concern because we are doing everything in a much better manner than we were doing previously. So why is there a cause of concern? There is nothing wrong. Similar to the first pilot who was ignoring the readings of the fuel tank and was saying that this plane is flying okay. Now the question is, is it okay to see only, only certain readings and ignore the rest? Because if that happens, if we do not take all the readings into account, it is possible that the plane may crash or the earth may do. So we need to get the full picture to make an informed decision. Now, here it is also important to highlight the, the differences between the economic thought process and the, the ecological thought process as we are seeing currently. Now, this is something that needs to be changed. Currently, the economists and the ecologists are having a different thought process. They are looking at different dials and they are coming to different conclusions. We need to bring both of them to the same page. But before bringing them to the same page, it is important to realize what are the differences between both of these. So the first one is the time horizon. The economist looks at a much smaller time horizon than the ecologist. The time horizon in the case of economics is say the next year, the next decade, or probably the next century, but not beyond that. Whereas when the ecologist looks at things, he looks at things at an ecological time scale and also at the evolutionary time scale. So the ecologist might say that we should plan for say the next hundreds of years or probably we should plan for the next millions of years. Because a number of these processes in ecology, they happen at such a slow pace that whatever harm we do to the environment will come to the results or we will face the consequences after a time being. So the ecologist says that uh, whenever we are setting up uh, any new industry, the ecologist would say, oh, hang on. First, let us see if we can uh, carry on with, with this level of pollution. Why don't you go and install, say, uh, a, a catalytic converter to reduce the amount of smoke that is coming down? Now, the, the economist would say, oh, if I install this machine or if, if I install this equipment, probably I'll be able to recuperate the cost in, say, the next 30 years. So this is not good from an economic point of view, but the ecologist might say that, no, 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 this is extremely crucial. Otherwise, we might uh, have a situation of acid rain. Now, this time horizon needs to be kept in mind. Secondly, the differences between sustainability and utility. Now, uh, sustainable development means a development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of the future generations to meet their own needs. So when we talk about sustainability, we are keeping a long-term time horizon. So sustainability says that we need to meet the requirements of this generation while ensuring that the next generations and the generations after that will also be in a position to meet their own requirements. So we are taking a long uh, time span. Whereas in the case of utility, utility is a measure of happiness or satisfaction. And this measure of happiness or satisfaction is used for current status, for the current population. We do not calculate utility for the next generation. We calculate the utility for us. Now, in the case of economics, we are more concentrated with the current generation. So we concentrate on utility. In the case of ecological thought process, we look at sustainable development. We look at... Uh, in, in the case of sustainable development as well, we are emphasizing that we need to meet the requirements of the present generation. But then sustainable development says that, okay, we should meet the requirements of this generation, but we also need to ensure that the next generation 
is also not harmed in the longer time span. So this is again another difference between the ecological and the economic thought process at present. Now, the concept of utility has brought us to a thought process that is known as utilitarianism. Now, utilitarianism is the political philosophy according to which the government should choose policies to maximize the total utility of everyone in the society. Now, utility, as we have seen, is the measure of happiness or satisfaction. Now, utilitarianism says that we need to maximize this satisfaction of all the people in the current society. So it is the political philosophy according to which the government should choose policies to maximize the total utility of everyone in the society. Now, the important thing to keep in mind in the case of utilitarianism or its definition is that nowhere it says that we need to maximize the utility for the current society as well as of the future generation. It does not say that just says that we need to maximize the utility and such a thought process in which we want to maximize the utility of the current society can at times run counter to the thought of sustainability so this is a major difference between the ecological and the economic thought process another difference is whether we are okay with externalities or whether we need to internalize the externalities. Now, externalities are the impacts of one person's actions on the well-being of a bystander. The impact of the actions of one person on the well-being of a bystander. And, it, uh, and there are two kinds of externalities, a negative externality and a positive externality. Now, negative externality means that the actions of one person create a negative impact on the well-being of the bystander. Then we call it a negative externality such as exhaust from industries or exhaust from automobiles. Now, the industrialist who has set up the industry is getting all the benefits from the profits that the industry is bringing in. But the pollution that is caused by the industry, it is causing a harm to the society on a whole. It could even be at the global level in the case of uh, certain chemicals that are being released. Now, the negative consequences are faced by everyone in the society. The positive consequences are retained by the industrialist. So this is an example of a negative externality because the industrialist, when he or she is taking this decision, on whether or not I should set up this industry and what sort of pollution containing measures should I be putting up, then he only takes these decisions on the basis of maximizing his or her own utility, maximizing his or her own profits. And these could even be at the cost of the local surroundings. Because the local surroundings will suffer because of the pollution. It's not just the industrialist himself or herself alone who will suffer. So this is an example of a negative externality. Positive externality is when the action of one person has a positive impact on the well-being of others or on the well-being of a bystander. Good examples are education. So if you educate yourself, if you make yourself a more learned person, then the decisions that you would make in your lifetime, they are going to help not just yourself, but also your society and also your country and also the world. So by educating yourself, you are not only bringing a positive impact on yourself, but you are also bringing a positive impact on everybody else. Similarly, if you keep yourself healthy, if you vaccinate yourself, you play a role in uh, stopping the movement of diseases or stopping the spread of diseases. So vaccination or health or exercising daily, these are all um, actions that have a positive impact on the well-being of others or on the well-being of the society or the country as a whole. So these are positive externalities. Now, the, the economic thought process states that we mostly concentrate on the well-being of ourselves. Because economics, as we have seen before, that economics, con uh, economics considers 
that everybody is a rational person. Now, rationally, if I am an industrialist, I am setting up an industry, and whether or not I should put up um, an equipment to contain uh, pollution is the question before me. Now, rationally, if I do not suffer from the consequences, there is nobody to force me to install this equipment. And if I install the equipment, my profits will go down because there is an investment that is involved not only in the installation of the equipment but also in its running cost. So rationally, I might take the the decision that I should not install the pollution containing device because I am taking this decision rationally. So this is the economic thought process. The ecological thought process would say no. all the externalities if they get internalized in that case what is the decision that a rational person should make is the correct decision which means that an ecologist might say that okay if so if such and such amount of pollution is released and it causes so and so amount of health impacts on the surrounding people and if all of those people were to go to a hospital for their treatment what is the total cost of that treatment that everybody would have to pay if you sum that up and if the industrialist were to pay that cost because the uh, it is the action of the industrialist that has brought harm to those people so the industrialist should pay for the cost the polluter pays principally now if that were the situation then what is the decision that a rational industrialist would make is the correct decision in other words what we are saying here is that suppose the cost of installing the pollution controlling device is uh rupees 10 lakhs and the cost of health care of people in the vicinity if device is not installed is say 30 lakhs and if the industrialist had to pay this cost so in that case if the industrialist does not pay the cost of treatment then he would have to pay uh rupees 0 but if the industrialist has to pay the cost of treatment then he would have to pay rupees 30 lakhs now if this is the situation before the industrialist and the industrialist has got two options option 1 is that he or she should get the pollution controlling device installed in which case the cost to the industrialist would be 10 lakh rupees the second option is that okay you do not want to install this pollution containing device fine go ahead but any harm that you do to the surroundings you'll have to pay for that that is you'll have to pay for the health uh, treatments for all the people in the surroundings that you have harmed because you have not installed this pollution containing device and that cost is 30 lakhs now what would a rational industrialist prefer would he prefer paying 10 lakhs or would he prefer paying 30 lakhs the answer is very simple he would prefer paying 10 lakhs rupees only and he would install this machine or this equipment into his factory but this is only possible when the in, uh, when the externalities get internalized when we have a mechanism to force the industrialist to pay the cost of treatment if we do not have such a mechanism if we do not have a way of internalizing the externality the uh the options before the industrialist are very different so he has the option of cost of not installing the pollution 
controlling device which is zero rupees and the cost of installing the pollution controlling device which is 10 lakhs of rupees so if the externalities are not internalized the two options are whether to pay zero rupees or whether to pay 10 lakhs of rupees and of course a rational industrialist would prefer not to pay uh, any uh, amount he would prefer to pay zero rupees and he would not install the pollution controlling device so internalizing of the externalities is a very powerful concept to help people make the right decisions now the ecological thought process emphasizes that all the externalities need to be internalized before we take a decision on the correct course of action here again remember that the decision is a rational decision but it says that before taking any decision let us first internalize all the externalities so this is a major thought difference between and uh, the ecological thought process and the economic thought process now what are the mechanisms or what are the methods of internalizing these externalities now the first option is a command and control policy in which case the government has a big role so in the command and control policy such as regulation the government would say okay no matter what happens we are only going to permit an industry to be set up if the industrialist gets uh, this pollution controlling device installed otherwise there is no permission at all so you cannot set up an industry till you agree to install the pollution controlling device so this is one way of internalizing the uh, uh, the externality or another way of regulation is that if anything goes wrong the polluter will have to pay the industrialist would have to pay and we will make use of the government machinery we will make use of the law and order machinery to ensure that if the surrounding people are harmed then the industrialist would have to pay that is another way of regulating things so in a command and control economy or uh, in a command and control government this this is one way of ensuring that the externalities get internalized but not just the uh, government's role we also have certain market based policies market based policies include things like pigovian taxes and subsidies now in the case of pigovian taxes and subsidies the government says that we are going to impose a tax or we are going to provide a subsidy not because we want to increase our resources through taxation and not because we want to support a particular person through subsidizing but we are going to use it to ensure or to incentivize people to do something or to refrain from doing something so in that case it will be called a pigovian taxation or a subsidy now how would a pigovian taxation or subsidy work in this case the government might say that okay the cost of installing uh this pollution controlling device is 10 lakhs of rupees and we are going to subsidize 9 lakhs of it so that if any person has to uh, install this machine he or she only has to pay 1 lakh of rupees now in this way the government is turning the table the government is saying that uh, you do not have to now make a choice between paying uh, 0 rupees and paying 10, uh, 10 lakhs of rupees you have you only have to make a choice between paying 0 rupees and paying 1 lakh of rupees and paying 1 lakh it should be a, an easy matter for an industrialist the government might in some cases even bring the subsidies to a level that it becomes zero or the government might even say that okay if somebody installs this device we are going to pay that person 11 lakhs so in that case the government is paying 1 lakh of rupees to incentivize the person and also covering up all the costs of installing this device now this is an example of a pigovian subsidy an example of a pigovian taxation or uh, would be say uh, if uh, anything go, uh, uh, if uh, there is a person who is not installing this pollution controlling device then there would be a higher level of taxation to ensure that the government has sufficient funds to uh, to cover up if uh, there is uh, something uh, if there is a negative impact to the health of the vicinity so in that case the government would say that okay you do not have to pay 
we are going to to take care of all the citizens but to take care of the citizens we also require money we also require taxation so if you do if you make this choice that you are not going to install this pollution controlling device so in that case you will have to pay 5 lakhs of rupees as taxes every year and then the industrialist would think that okay if i install this machine i only have to pay 10 lakhs of rupees if i do not install this machine i'll have to pay 5 lakhs of rupees every year and so uh, in a span of like 2 years i would uh, have already paid the cost of the machine and from the third year onwards i will be be paying more than 10 lakhs of rupees so then the the choice becomes much simpler the industrialist would say okay uh, if i can get a tax break by installing this machine let me go for the the tax break let me install this machine so pigovian taxes and subsidies are also a mechanism through which we can ensure that the externalities get internalized and people take those decisions in which others are not harmed another example is a tradable pollution permit in the case of tradable pollution permits the government might say that every industry can release only 100 units of noxious fumes or pollutants and if any industry releases more than 100 units then the industry will be completely shut down or you have another option the government might say that the other option is that in place of say uh, polluting uh, 100 units you are only polluting say 20 units so in that case you have 80 units left with you and you can sell these units to some other industry who is unable to reduce their levels of pollution so what we are saying here is that you have an industry that has a quota of 100 units and if the industry only uses 20 units of quota then they can sell off 80 units now who is going to buy these 80 units there are certain industries for which it is easier to bring down the levels of pollution such as our industry in question in which uh, we have a device that is available to uh, to reduce the levels of pollution on the other hand there could be certain industries that have such processes in which it is very difficult to reduce pollution now the aim of the government here is to ensure that the total level of pollution is uh, down and is uh, and it does not cross a threshold so in the case of these tradable pollution permits what would happen is that our industrialist might think that okay if i install this device i will have to pay 10 lakhs of rupees but by installing this device i will be able to save so much on my quota and i can sell off this quota to uh, my neighbor who uh, who is unable to install such a machine and he is going to pay me say uh, 5 lakhs of rupees every year and if such a situation arises then in 2 years i will be able to recuperate the cost of installing this device and from the third year onwards i will be earning a profit on it now in such a scenario the industrialist would go for uh, installing this device now the benefit to the industrialist in this case is that he or she is able to earn the profit the benefit to the society is that the level of pollution has been contained and the benefit to the other industry is that it is able to pollute more than 100 units by purchasing this from somewhere else so total level of pollution is all is already down but this has brought in a market mechanism through which one industry can sell off part of its quota so to someone else and a big benefit in such scenarios to the society is that those industries for which it is uh, easier and it is cheaper to reduce the levels of pollution they become the first ones to reduce uh, the level of pollution so essentially the society is able to reduce the pollution at a lower cost so this is another mechanism that is available to internalize the externalities then we also have certain private solutions private solutions include things like social norms and mores now in the case of social norms and mores 
there could be a, a social norm in a society that we uh, that we uh, should not uh, give respect to those people who are polluting the environment so in that case Uh, the level of pollution is brought down by a social action so people might might boycott those uh, those industrialists who are doing uh, a lot of pollution and people might start to honor those industrialists who have taken exemplary steps to reduce the levels of pollution so through social norms and mores also we can internal uh, we can bring in a, a mechanism to internalize the externality other examples are charities to social causes so there could be say an ngo who uh, who is able to uh, uh, to procure these pollution controlling devices and this ngo goes and fits this uh, device to to uh, to different industries say free of cost but then how does this ngo get money to run this operation through donations now in this case the private solution is charity to this ngo so the people who are there in the vicinity they might pay to this ngo as a charity so that the total level of pollution that they have to uh, tolerate it goes down so through charities and through ngos and other social causes as well there is a mechanism to internalize the externalities and bring these negative consequences down so this is another economic way in which uh, somebody pays so that the level of pollution goes down another private solution is integrating different businesses uh and this normally occurs in the case of positive externalities so integrating different businesses it means that if somebody has an apple orchard and some uh, and this person also starts an apiary to raise honey bees now in such a scenario what happens is that the person is able to produce honey and sell off the honey and at the same time this person also has the honey bees to pollinate his apple orchard so because both of these businesses help each other aid each other so then it also makes a uh, 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 an economic sense to integrate both of these businesses together so this is also another way in which internal uh, in which externalities are internalized and especially the positive externalities another the uh, private solution is through bargaining and contracts such as the coast theorem now in the case of bargaining it is possible that the residents of this area who are there in the surroundings they might come to the industrialists and they might try to bargain they might say that okay you are releasing so much amount of uh, pollutants and that is harming us so why don't we come up with a with an arrangement that can suit you as well as it can suit us because remember if the if there is no way in which uh, the residents can force the government to take an action then the residents might take this action by themselves so in this case the industrialist wants to reduce the cost of installing this device and the residents want to save their health so essentially the industrialist does not want to put in uh, 10 lakhs of rupees but if the industrialist does not put in 10 lakhs of rupees the residents would have to pay 30 lakhs of rupees for their own health so the residents might say okay why don't we do this thing why don't we uh, procure this machine and we install it into your industry so in that case the residents are benefited because in place of uh, paying 30 lakhs of rupees they will only have to pay 10 lakhs of rupees and the industrialist is also happy because he does not have to pay or in certain situations and uh, mm-hmm. something other than then this can also occur so it is also possible that the industrialist might say that uh, okay i um, it is not possible for me to install this device but why don't i pay you something so i will pay you i will i will compensate you for the health damages that you have and if the industrialist can come up with a figure that is less than 10 lakhs of rupees so that is also an arrangement between the society and the industrialist so these are different options that are available for internalization of the externalities now we'll look at coast theorem in more detail here 
So, Coase theorem says that if private parties can bargain without cost over the allocation of resources, they can solve the problem of externalities on their own. So it say it only talks about the private parties. So there is hardly any role of the government here. So if private parties can bargain without cost, that is, uh, it should not cost both these parties to come together in terms of time or in terms of money. That is, the transaction costs are reduced. So if the private parties can bargain without cost over the allocation of resources, they can solve the problem of externalities on their own. Now, let, uh, let us look at one example of this Coase theorem that we normally see in the case of uh, the uh, Tiger Reserves. Now, in Tiger Reserves, there are only a set number of vehicles that can get inside in, a, in any particular day. Why? Because uh, the National Tiger Conservation Authority looks at this matter and tries to ensure that there is no excessive level of pollution in the Tiger Reserves and at the same time, the animals are not excessively disturbed and so it regulates the number of vehicles that can get inside. Now, there might be some players who have a greater interest in getting inside. A common example is that there are certain uh, uh, gypsy operators or there are certain um, guides who are so good at their job that they receive quite a lot amount of uh, money in terms of uh, gifts or in terms of honorariums from the people who get inside. That is, it normally happens that uh, when uh, when this uh, gypsy uh, driver is getting, uh, is, is taking you to the park, he tells you about all different kinds of birds, he tells you about uh, all the stories that are associated with this park and because of that you are so much entertained that you pay him say 100 rupees extra. Because he not only took you uh, inside the park, but he also entertained you. So in that case, the benefit that this gypsy owner will get is much greater than the benefit of some other gypsy owner who is not good at uh, telling these stories or telling you about the birds and animals. So the uh, in the normal course of operation, one gypsy owner only gets the amount of money that he or she can charge for taking you inside but the other gypsy owner is also getting something extra. Another difference is that there are, uh, there are uh, some gypsies that are so old that the cost of running them is higher than say a new gypsy. So a person who has a new gypsy will probably be running at a much greater profit than, uh, than a person who is uh, having an old uh, gypsy. Now, if it so happens that a person who does not get a lot of money from uh, getting inside uh, has been chosen to get inside because of a roster system. And there is another person who thinks that if in place of this person, if I were to go, I can earn much more. Now, how can Coase theorem bring us to a solution that is beneficial to everybody? So let us look at this. What we are saying here is that there is this gypsy and if this gypsy goes inside, the profit is 2000 rupees. If it does not go inside, it gets a profit of 0 rupees because it is not flying inside. And different other gypsies have different levels of profits if they go inside. So there are certain gypsies that will earn more than 2000 rupees and there are certain gypsies that will earn less than 2000 rupees. So suppose these are the, the gypsies that have been selected as part of the roster system. That is when the NTCA says that nine gypsies can get inside. So these are the nine gypsies that were chosen and this gypsy was not chosen. Now the NTCA is concerned that only nine gypsies should get inside. The NTCA is not concerned which gypsy should get inside. Now, how can Coase theorem solve, uh, bring us to a much better solution? Now, suppose this person whose gypsy was not selected, he bargains with this person who, if he gets inside, will only earn 900 rupees. And this person says 
that okay in place of you getting inside let me go inside and i will pay you so this person is saying that i will earn much more profit if i get inside and so in please so it is your turn to get inside but you give that turn to me and uh, to compensate you i will pay you some money for this jumping right so to speak now how much amount of money will be paid anything that is between the profit of this gypsy that is 900 rupees and the profit of this gypsy that is 2000 rupees so let us say that both of these bargain and they agree on 1200 rupees 1200 rupees and so this gypsy owner says that okay you pay me 1200 rupees and i will keep my gypsy outside and you can go in my uh, place now what happens this person who would have earned 900 rupees has now earned 1200 rupees and so this person is happy because in place of earning 900 he is earning 1200 what about this person now if this person did not get inside because he was not selected in this in today's roster so he would have earned 0 rupees but now that he has earned this uh, uh, he has a uh, uh, paid for these jumping rights and he now has the the chance to get inside he will be earning 12, uh, 2000 rupees now out of these 2000 rupees he will be paying 1200 rupees to to this gypsy owner and now he will be left with 800 rupees so for this gypsy owner the choice was either 0 rupees or 800 rupees and this gypsy owner is now earning 800 rupees so he is also happy so this gypsy owner is happy because he earned 300 rupees more this gypsy owner is happy because he earned 800 rupees more and ntca of course is happy because only nine gypsies got inside and there is uh, uh, no other issue with this so by bargaining themselves by uh, by uh, by doing these uh, this bargain both of these parties have come up with a solution that is beneficial to both of them so this is an example of coarse theorem and we normally apply coarse theorem in the case of conservation these days uh, for example through payment of ecosystem services and a good example of this is the catskill watershed now what is this story in new york the water that is supplied comes from these mountains that are known as catskill mountains now uh, the city of new york has got two options option 1 is uh, which is the default option that most of us use is that whatever water comes uh, to the uh, to the city has to be treated so you set up a, a water treatment facility and you run this facility and you uh, pay for its installation you pay for its running and uh, this is the amount of money that you will have to spend to get good quality water the second option that these people thought was that why don't we do something so that the water that comes to the to the city does not have to be treated at all so they started looking at what causes pollution in this water and they saw that the people in this catskill mountains they were also doing agriculture and uh, when these people do agriculture they will be using fertilizers they will be using pesticides and these chemicals were coming into the water so the people of new york they said okay why don't we do one thing if we set up our water treatment facility and say we have to pay uh, uh, say uh, 1 million dollars if in place of uh, doing uh, or spending this 1 million dollar every year if we pay say 500000 dollars to the people who live top there on the catskill mountains and will say uh, will tell them that uh, you uh, that you guys refrain from using the fertilizers you guys refrain from using the pesticides and of course if uh, the fertilizers and pesticides are not used then your crop yields will go down and we are going to compensate you for that so we are paying you these 500000 dollars so to compensate you for the lower productivity now the farmers might think that okay if i do not use fertilizers and pesticides my crop yields surely go down but if 
but they uh, but what is the extent to which they go down it is not that we will be able to produce no crops we will be able to produce crops but probably of uh, a lesser quantity so if they calculate and they come to this conclusion that okay if we go for organic agriculture we will only be earning 300000 uh, dollars in place of say 400000 dollars that we are earning every year so there is a loss of 100000 dollars every year but now these guys are paying us 500000 dollars to go for organic cultivation so what's the harm so in this way the uh, the farmers who are out there in the catskill mountains they are able to earn much more than what they would have earned through a traditional agriculture so they are benefited and the people of new york they would uh, in place of shelling out say uh, 1 million dollars every year they can make go with 500000 dollars so there is a cost cutting there is a saving for the people of new york as well now this is an example of coast theorem in which there are two parties that are doing a bargaining at their own private levels and they are coming up with a solution that is beneficial to both of them the farmers are happy the people of new york are happy and of course uh, the water quality because it is uh, now so good that it can be directly um, uh, used uh, for drinking so it also harms uh, it also helps the environment because you do not have to pay uh, a cost of installation you do not have to uh, release uh, say greenhouse gases because of because you would have required electricity to run your plants so it helps the environment as well it also helps the biodiversity because those uh, fertilizers and pesticides that were polluting the waters are now not there and so the biodiversity also is much better another difference between the economic and the ecological thought process is the kinds of goods that we are concerned with and we can divide goods and services into four different categories based on two uh, concepts whether they are uh, excludable and whether they are rival in consumption now what does this mean excludability means that the property of a good whereby a person can be prevented from using it now what does that mean it means that if i have this pen i can say that this is my pen and i will not allow you to use this pen in that case this pen is an item that is an excludable item so i can exclude others from using this pen rivalry in consumption means the property of a good whereby one person's use diminishes other person's use it means that if there is a tree and this tree is all full of mangoes and if i go there and if i take these mangoes and if i eat these mangoes there are less mangoes that are available for you to take out so your consumption and my consumption are rivals of each other the more i consume the less you consume the more you consume the less i consume so this is known as rivalry in consumption now on the basis of excludability and rivalry in consumption we have four different kinds of goods there are certain goods that are both excludable and rivals in consumption which are known as private goods such as clothing now clothing is excludable because i can always say that this is my cloth and i will not permit you to use it at the same time it is a rival in consumption because if i purchase uh, one uh, one piece of cloth from a shop then it is not available for you to purchase so there is a rivalry in consumption either i can have this cloth or you can have this cloth then there are other goods that are excludable but they are not rivals in consumption such as fire protection so in the case of fire protection we can say that we are only going to provide fire protection to these people who are paying for it so we can always say that if there is a society that pays for fire protection we will provide them with fire services if a society does not pay for it we will not provide it with fire services but this is not a rival in consumption because if you pay for this uh, for fire services and you are able to get the fire services it does not mean that i will not get the fire services so it is not a rival in consumption so these goods are known as club goods then there are certain other goods that are rival in consumption 
but they are non excludable such as the environment now why are these non excludable because a thing such as the air now if i am breathing air i cannot prevent you from breathing the air so it is non excludable but it is rival in consumption because if i uh, add pollutants to my air then because it is a non excludable thing and the air is there everywhere so these pollutants will also reach to you so the more i harm this resource or the more i consume this resource the less is available for you so this is a non excludable but rival in consumption so this is a common resource and the fourth kind of good is known as a public good such as the national defense it is neither excludable nor a rival in consumption because if my country is protected your country is also protected so it's non excludable and if i protect my country it is not that your country is not protected so it is not a rival in consumption now the difference between the economic thought process and the ecological thought process is that a lot of ecological thought process occurs around the common resources such as the environment whereas the majority of economic thought process occurs around private goods so there is this major difference between the thinking of economists they are more concerned about private goods and the thinking of the ecologists who are more concerned about the common resources now we'll look at an example to see that it is not that both of these thought processes are very different we can uh, we can bring the economists and the ecologists on the same page we can bring to bring them to a common solution that can benefit both of them and this example is one of the uh, linear infrastructure now linear infrastructure refers to those basic physical and organizational structures and facilities that are needed for the operation of a society or enterprise so this much portion is the definition of an infrastructure those basic physical and organizational structures and facilities that are needed for the operation of a society or an enterprise but linear infrastructure means that they can be represented as straight or curved lines and examples are roads railways power lines canals pipelines and so on so road is an infrastructure that you can represent either as a straight line between two points or as a curved line between two points so this is a linear infrastructure so good examples are roads railways pipelines and so on now it is known that linear infrastructure through the wildlife areas leads to conflicts so this is something that the ecologist wants to avoid so the ecologist says that if you build a road in the forest areas it harms the biodiversity how does it harm the biodiversity because animals use roads so we normally see animals on all different kinds of roads and if there are uh, vehicles that are plying then there are also accidents and animals die on getting collided with different vehicles so roads are a method of killing roads also cause pollution in terms of air pollution sound pollution and light pollution so if there is a road then you are also harming the forest you are harming the biodiversity you are providing a means through which people can throw waste products into the forest which is another harm roads are barriers to wildlife movement because this wildlife area is very different from this paved structure of the road and so a number of times the animals who want to move from this side to this side will avoid going on top of the road so they act as barriers they act as physical barriers they act as psychological barriers and a lot of this has also to got to do with the amount of uh, or the number of vehicles that are flying per unit time if you have very less number of vehicles then probably the animals are able to cross the road if you have very large number of vehicles then probably the animals see a wall of vehicles that is flying through these roads and they just do not cross but in these central areas where the vehicle density is in between the animal sees that okay vehicles are coming but they are not coming 
at such a, a, a huge density that I might be unable to cross. So the animal thinks, okay, let me take a chance and cross this road. And as it tries to cross, there's a vehicle that comes and hits this animal and the animal dies. So in this middle region, we have the highest number of deaths as shown in this red curve. And uh, when we look at this barrier effect, it also depends on a number of other uh, factors such as traffic intensity. If there is more traffic intensity, they, there will be a wall of vehicles, the speed of vehicles, the sensitivity of the drivers, whether they are using headlights or horns and so on, the presence and location of animal crossings. So if there is a road with a very heavy traffic, but then there is also a bridge and the animal can cross under the bridge. So in that case, uh, it is not very big of a barrier. Movement pattern of the species. So in the, especially in the rainy seasons, when a number of species are on the move, the barrier effect is much more pronounced. Species specific preference of road use. There are some species that are more comfortable in using a road. There are some species that completely avoid the road. The edge features. What is the height of the embankment? If the embankment is too high, the animals will be unable to get to the road. So that will be a very great barrier. Time of the day, time of the year and species diversity in the surroundings. Another harm with these linear infrastructures like roads is that roads fragment the habitats. So here you have one habit, uh, you, here you were having a big habitat and now it has fragmented it into these three sections. There was this beautiful forest, but now the animals cannot cross from this side to this side. So it has created a fragmentation. Construction of roads, it causes loss and destruction of habitats. Because to construct roads or railway lines, you will have to cut off trees. You will have to perform earthwork. So even during construction, it creates a problem for biodiversity. It can lead. Uh, so this is an example of earthwork in which a big sized hole has been dug. Construction causes loss and destruction of habitat. Roads also facilitate the destruction of habitat. Why? Because roads permit accessibility to different areas. So if people can reach to an area, they can also uh, come there and cut trees. They can also poach animals. So roads also facilitate the destruction of habitat. Roads also increase interaction with humans. So this is an example in which a nail guy hit a vehicle the nail guy died on the spot, but both the people uh, that were traveling in the vehicle were also critically injured. Roads change animal behavior. So langurs normally do not interact with humans, but because people have been feeding the, uh, these langurs, so now it has changed their behavior so that they always come up to beg for food. This is another example. These people are feeding these animals. They are feeding the monkeys, they are feeding the langurs. They are feeding the wild pig, they are feeding the peacock. And this is not a behavior that we would see in a natural surrounding. Normally, if you uh, step out of your vehicle, all the animals will just run away. They are so afraid of humans. But in this case, the behavior has completely changed. In a number of situations, there are also incidents in which the animals attack the vehicles. This is also an issue for, for people because uh, one option that the ecologist might suggest is that we should reduce the speed limit so that if the vehicles are flying at a lower speed, then there is a chance that the animals will be saved because the animals will have much greater time to cross and avoid the vehicle, avoid the collision. But then if we try to reduce the speed of the road, then that is also having an impact on development because we normally want to go from point A to point B as soon as possible. And this will hamper that. So, linear infrastructures lead to a number of human-wildlife conflict situations. A human-wildlife conflict occurs when the wildlife requirements encroach on those of human populations with cost to both the residents and the wild animals. Examples include things like crop depredation, spreading of diseases, predation of humans and livestock, road accidents, poaching, habitat degradation, loss, road kills and so on. So what is the option that is left with us? The option to avoid these conflict situations is to keep humans and wildlife separate from each other. 
the option is education and awareness the option is mitigation measures underpasses overpasses canopy bridges culverts and so on now what do we mean by these mitigation measures remember we uh, said uh, a short while back that if there is a road and uh, this road is acting as a big barrier but there is also a bridge so the animals may use the bridge to cross and in that case the interaction between the animals and the humans goes down so the animal is saved because it avoids a collision the humans are saved because uh, there is no vehicle uh, there is no animal to harm their vehicles and they can also move at a much faster speed so this is a mitigation option that is available but the question is how do we ensure the implementation of this mitigation option and do we need to have these mitigation options at all places even for smaller animals the answer is yes the ecologists would say yes the, these smaller animals play a very big role as scavengers and if these animals were not there then uh, uh, we will have a very big problem of dead animals that are not being disposed of now either the economists and the ecologists might go on disputing these facts or the other option is to bring them both to the same page and to make the economist realize that uh, that that these mitigation measures not only protect the animals but they also increase surplus they enhance the surplus of the society why because they lead they reduce the chances of human deaths and accidents vehicles fly at higher speeds which leads to economic prosperity it also aids in the conservation of biodiversity which has its own benefits for enhancing the surplus of the society now the point to emphasize here is that the mitigation measure is not just a tool of conservation it is also a tool of good economics and this is why it is important to understand economics so that you can make the economist understand things in his or her own language so if you were to portray a bridge or a mitigation measure as a way of protecting wild animals then probably the economist might not agree but if you portray a bridge or a mitigation measure as a means of enhancing surplus by protecting the lives of human beings by protecting the property of human beings by ensuring that they are able to move at faster speeds and by giving them the benefits of biodiversity then probably it will be a very different matter the economics may completely agree with your point of view now similarly it is important for the ecologist also to understand that we cannot go on saying that okay this thing is important for animals so this has to be done because that is not a persuasive argument you also have to know about economics so that you can make use of the language of economics you can make use of the thought process of economics to portray your case in a much better manner so the implementation of these tools such as the mitigation measures can be ensured through an understanding of economic decision making and incorporation of a thorough economic analysis not just a superficial one so in other words we can say that economics is a good for tool conservation for good conservation if you did not have economics you would not be able to perform conservation because nobody is going to listen to you and at the same time conservation is a tool for good economics because by using the tools of conservation we are able to enhance the total surplus of the society now it is important to remember here that both the economist and the ecologist are working for the same goal of enhancing the total surplus of the society but both of us need to understand each other's controls each other's uh, devices so that we do not fall prey to the situation in which there are two pilots and they are not understanding each other's controls they are looking at completely different readings and it is important to remember here that the solution to the issues that have been generated by economic decisions uh in certain circles it is very fashionable to say that all the harm to the environment has been done due to economic decisions that were taken whether we talk about pollution whether we talk about global warming whether we talk about loss of biodiversity 
there are certain ecologists who always put the blame on the economists and say that oh it is because of the economists that all these harms have come uh, to mother nature it is it is important to for them to realize that the solution to these issues that were generated by economic decisions is more economics and not less it is their duty to ensure that the economists also get the point of view that these tools of conservation are also the tools of if of better economics and of enhancing the service of the society so that's all for today thank you for your attention jai